Everything you think you know about election is wrong. Everything you've been told about election is wrong. Everything you've been taught about election is wrong. Everything you've read about election is wrong, if you read it outside Scripture. Mostly everything you thought when you read what Scripture had to say about election was wrong, and there are reasons for that. What your pastor thinks about election is wrong. What your professor thinks about election is wrong. The last conversation you had about election was wrong. Is this your fault? Perhaps it is. Maybe it's not. We're not going to deal with whose fault it is. We're just going to solve the problem. In this video, we're going to deal with the concept of election. Election is nothing like you were told. Before we get started, thanks to everyone who donates to the channel. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Election is one of those terms that has a lot of baggage with it. It's loaded with baggage. We've looked at past videos when we look at, for example, our video on Calvinistic context injection, how Calvinists have a way of avoiding the context of the of the passage by taking one of their key preloaded terms and injecting a whole bunch of meaning into a term and then every time that term appears that they bring the, all the meaning along with it and we know that that's not a good way to do things we looked in Calvinistic context injection we looked at how context can actually make means word make context can actually make words mean exactly the opposite of what the actual dictionary definition is. Context is everything. So what the Calvinist needs to do to avoid contact, context, they need to hijack terms and make you think. They need, it, it's almost like a post-hypnotic suggestion. Every time you see this word, you will. I've actually seen somebody hypnotized and they got a post-hypnotic suggestion where every time they heard the word brick, they dropped down and did flutter kicks, and I didn't believe it until I saw it with my own eyes. But it was pretty amazing. And election is one of those words, it's almost like we get a theologically trained post-hypnotic suggestion that every time you see the word elect or election or chosen, you think something that isn't so. And what you usually think is salvation. Christians, both Calvinists and Bible believers, have the problem, because we have these Calvinistic presuppositions in our head, we deal with the concept of election as if it is synonymous and interchangeable with the concept of salvation. So every time you see elect, whether you're Calvinist or not, you're thinking elect to be saved. Okay? And then within the Calvinist umbrella, which would include Arminians, which I'm not an Arminian, they think that either election to be saved is unconditional if you're a Calvinist, or... It's based on foreknowledge. By foreknowledge, you're chosen, elected to be saved in the Arminian branch of Calvinism. And neither one of those are correct because election is not about salvation. So election in the minds of people, because of baggage that comes along with it, because of terminology hijacking, because of terminology loading, people ha use election interchangeably and synonymously with salvation with chosen to be saved, and they use it synonymously and interchangeably with the concept of predestination. And all three of those things are very different. They just they do happen to overlap for the believer. In other, in other words, salvation, election, and predestination are all associated with the believer who's truly saved, but they are all different things. They're all different words with different definitions. They're spelled different. They sound different. They are different words. They mean different things, especially in the context in which they appear. Now, we've talked about this before. We have a previous video, which is the prequel to this video. You need to see this video as part two. Understand this as being part two as our video on election word occurrence analysis, which we did just a few weeks ago. In that video, we took every occurrence of the word election, which shows up as in, in the Hebrew and the Greek, every word in Hebrew or Greek which gets 
which gets dealt with, which gets translated as chosen choice, election, elect, anything of that sort. We looked at every one of them. And we have a spreadsheet that shows all 224 occurrences. And then we have a PowerPoint presentation that we went over, which shows all of those that might in any way be construed to mean something Calvinistic. And we showed in every occurrence that they don't mean anything Calvinistic. So Calvinists who are watching this, go watch that video first. A lot of you are going to hear what I'm going to say in this video, and you're going to post a button in the comments. You're going to load the comment section with a bunch of verses that have the word elect or chosen in it as if I haven't seen them. We did an entire video in public, which covers every single occurrence of every one of these. Now, if you want to get a copy of that, uh, of the spreadsheet or of the actual PowerPoint presentation with all of those, we have those. If you don't donate to this ministry, you can buy those on Etsy. And the link is in the description below. If you do donate to this ministry, send me an email and I will send you a link to where you can download these files for free if you already donate to this ministry. So you can get that. Whether you're a Calvinist or a non-Calvinist, you can go get those documents that I made, that spreadsheet, and you can look at them for yourself and you can, you can review every single one of them for yourself. And every single one of them has my comments along with it. So that video needs to be seen as the prequel to this video. If you haven't seen that video yet, it would behoove you to do so before continuing to watch this video. Because when you object to things that I say, the answer to your objection is probably already covered in that video. One of the most frustrating things I do is answer the exact same questions over and over and over and over again. So one of the reasons I make videos in, in the first place is because videos are scalable. Anybody can pull them down and watch what they are and see my perspective on things or what I think is the biblical perspective at any time. Anybody with access to YouTube can pull them down and watch them for free. And that's by design. But me answering every objection is not scalable. I've only got so much time in the day, just like anybody else. So I can't sit here and have an email or a comments debate with every single person who has every single objection. So if you want to make a comment, just about, by now I have so many videos online that just about every single Calvinistic objection to what I'm saying in one of my videos is covered in another one of my videos. So if you want to disagree with what I'm saying, I ask you, first of all, please do it substantively and not just emotionally. Secondly, please go look through the channel. Just click on my name on YouTube and look through the channel and see what other videos I have available because whatever you're objecting to is probably answered either in the video you didn't watch all the way through or in one of the many other videos that are on the channel that you haven't seen yet. There's over a hundred videos on Calvinism on there. Look through those before you start posting comments. It saves me time because I can't answer a thousand questions from, from a bunch of cage stagers who all ask the same thing. They, they pre-program their ideological possession right out. They're just an avatar of an ideology and they spit out all these same things over and over again. All these pre-programmed canned answers that Calvinists are constantly spitting out, they're already answered in all the other videos that I have. So don't comment like that. So we covered this issue, every occurrence of the word election or the Greek and Hebrew words that get translated as chosen, elect, and choice in that video. So please watch that video first. And those products are available. Either you can email me and I can send them to you or you can go get them off Etsy. Either way. So those products are available. So check that out for sure as we move forward in this video. In that video also, I covered 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. I'm not going to cover it here because I already covered it there. So go to that video and watch starting at minute marker 1810, and that's where I start talking about 2 Thessalonians 2.13, or you can type that link into your email, into your URL, into your internet browser, the URL section, and that will bring up that video at that minute marker, at 18.10. That's where I start talking about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. I'm not going to talk about 2 Thessalonians 2.13. And I am going to say things like, there is no place in Scripture where election means salvation. And yes, I already know about 2 Thessalonians 2.13, and I already covered it twice. I've got that video, and I have a whole other video just on 2 Thessalonians 2.13. So I'm not going to cover that here. 
So make sure you go look at those things before you comment on that in, in the comment section below. I've done my homework, please you go do yours as well. We have another video, and in that video, the non-Calvinist and non-Arminian view of election was hinted at in that video. Now, we didn't go into the details, but we have this chart down here, and if you look down a little past, a little past halfway, you'll see this place where I have the three columns, and on the see the check marks and the red X's over there? The, the, the column on the left is Calvinism, the column in the middle is Arminianism, and the column on the right-hand side is Biblical Christianity. Now, if you looked at that chart, election is based on foreknowledge. The Calvinist doesn't believe that. The Arminian does believe that. The Biblical Christianity does not hold that position. Sinners are unconditionally elected. Calvinism does hold that. Arminianism doesn't hold that. Biblical Christianity doesn't hold that. What you should notice is that there is a red X for both of those in Biblical Christianity, and I don't have a statement positively affirming what biblical Christianity's position is on election, which is why this video comes up. So if you looked at that chart closely, you should say, well, they marked red X on both of those. What do they believe? And I'm, I'm hoping that curiosity was gendered, and we're going to answer that curiosity here. It's been answered elsewhere, but we're taking this whole video set aside to do that. In our other video, 35 Truths That Destroy Calvinism, the Bible-believing view of election was mentioned in this video. Now, this video really wasn't designed just to destroy Calvinism, but it's hard sometimes, at least for me, to come up with um, creative titles that also show you their relevance. So what this really is, is just 35 things that I believe as a non-Calvinist and a non-Arminian, because I constantly get the question, what... You know, if you're not a Calvinist and not an Arminian, then what are you? Well, these are, these are the 35 things that I believe which are distinctive from the Calvo-Arminian umbrella, both Calvinism and the Arminian branch of Calvinism. So in that video, and this is a short video, it's less than 15 minutes. I think it's like 12 minutes or something like that. I forget, but it's not very long. I just cover those things. So if you wanted a synopsis of what the position is here at Beyond the Fundamentals, that's probably the fastest way to get it on, on all the key issues, on most of the key issues anyway. In that video, number three, is that election is to service, calling, and purpose, not to salvation. And in this video today, we are going to expand on point number three of that video. Election is to service, calling, and purpose, not to salvation. And then you can see the passages that I have there. Now we're going to cover some of those and some other ones as well. So that is the Bible-believing view, and we're going to expound on it here. Now when it comes to election, there's a couple of different ways you can deal with it. You can deal with it. You can leave the Calvinistic presumption of elect intact and just show why the Calvinistic... Because we'll, we'll talk about that a little more later. Now in this video, it's called Chosen, Censored, What They've Been Hiding from Ephesians 1.4. That, this video shows the problems with a Calvinistic view of Ephesians 1-4, but it does not address the biblical issue of election that we're going to deal with in this video. So we left, we left the Calvinistic presuppositions intact and just showed from other reasons why that would be wrong, even if you assume chosen means to salvation. So we left, I didn't deal with that there, but we're going to deal with it in this video because sometimes you got to take baby steps one thing at a time. First of all, what you already believe doesn't match Scripture. Second of all, what you, the premises on which your beliefs are based are completely wrong, and here's why. Sometimes it, it helps to deal with those things separately. So in that video, I literally cover the screen with screenshots of Calvinists who discuss being chosen before the foundation of the world while they leave out the most important qualifier, which is the phrase, "...in him." Now, when you bring this up, Calvinists deny that they do this. We don't leave this out, but the, the preponderance of evidence is overwhelming, especially if you've ever talked to a Calvinist about this issue. So it's very easy to find. I have screenshots from all sorts of Calvinists who all say the phrase chosen before the foundation of the world, and they leave out and what the scripture says is chosen in him from before the foundation of the world. They all leave out in him. Now, I'm not saying every Calvinist ever always leaves it out all the time, okay? You can find a Calvinist including the phrase in him in their commentaries and books and things like that. But when they're writing an informal article, when they're having an informal discussion, sometimes when they're in a debate, when they're 
just generally talking about this issue, especially the, you know, the rank and file Calvinists, that phrase chosen before the foundation of the world is right on the tip of their tongue all the time without the phrase in him as part of it. And that's a huge problem. And I pointed that out in that video. Um, I would not necessarily call that video a prequel to this one, but it would not hurt to have already watched that video before you come watch this one. That is, that's an older video, but it checks out. So we're in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. That's the very first time the word elect shows up in scripture. And we see in Matthew chapter 12 that that is a direct reference to the Messiah because we're, that's confirmed in the New Testament. Now you see, behold my, you see the word servant and the word elect used interchangeably. People today use elect interchangeably with the concept of salvation and interchangeably with the concept of predestination. In this video, we're going to focus on it being used interchangeably with salvation. But we notice in the Bible that the interchangeability with it is with servitude, being of service, being a servant, not with being a salvation. In other words, the role the person is supposed to serve by their actions and behavior. That's the idea. And sometimes... You can be elect in that sense either before you're saved or even like the Jews who are referred to as the election, even when they're being hardened and blinded and the individuals are going to hell. They still serve a role or a purpose. They are still elect to fill that role, which they still do. In the Common Man's Reference Bible, now when I, when I mention sources, do not be that person who goes out and finds something horrible, horrible about this source and then put all that in the comments. I do not agree with everything this guy says or anybody that I ever quote, okay? So don't be that person. Be the kind of person that can evaluate a statement based on its own merits without having to run and do an ad hominem attack on the person or what their other beliefs are or anything like that, okay? I don't agree with everything this guy says. Some things are way far out there, but some things are very thought-provoking, okay? And that, that goes for you too, <laughs> and for me, by the way. So in the Common Man's Reference Bible, 3rd edition, the hardback edition, David Allen Hoffman, 2015, page 1071, he says this is the first occurrence of the word elect. Okay, The doctrine of election deals with service, not salvation. A citizen or a son is chosen or elected to serve, and the references are given. The term mine elect, like in this case, is a doctrinal reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's confirmed in the New Testament. But the elect is primarily a remnant of the children of Israel. All right, now I agree with that statement, and it's a thought-provoking statement. I think that was actually the, the first note that I read in that Bible. Uh, somebody gave that to me as a gift a couple of years ago, and uh, I was very interested by this comment because I'd been thinking something along the same lines for a while, and I saw it somewhere else. So what you start seeing is the concept of elect and election being used interchangeably with being a servant, Okay, now that is key. That's very important. That's the flavor the Bible gives it. So when you read the Bible, I want you to put aside everything you've ever thought, everything you've ever been taught, everything you've ever heard. You put all that stuff aside because it's filled with presuppositions you're trying to get rid of anyway. Let's just look at the flavor that the Bible gives to the terms that it uses. Now, Pretty early on in Christianity, in the 4th century, a guy named Augustine came along, and Augustine used to be a Manachian Gnostic, and Gnostics have their version of the elect, which has to do with who will and who will not be chosen to be the ones who are the enlightened ones, okay? And that's the same kind of thinking Calvinism has. When he could not... He and, and Pelagius were both heretics for different reasons, okay? When he could not beat Pelagius, he abandoned scripture and went to the philosophy and went to the whole will thing. That's why all the Calvinists refer to people as free will worshipers who believe the Bible because they're hung up on the will and they think we are too. They start with the concept of the will like Pelagius and Augustine did and they think that we do too, but we don't. Our hang up is scriptural authority. Their hang up is the will. We could care less about the will of man. It just so happens that we don't limit off <laughs> like they do. They, they, presuppose what the Bible is not allowed to say about the will of man, and they close it off that way. 
They, they worship their own presupposition of the human will. Now, we, we have no such presupposition. Our presupposition is that God exists, the Bible came from God, and that it's true. Scriptural authority. Those are our presuppositions. That's all they are. Their presupposition is that there is no free will. All right. Now, they got that from Augustine, who got it from Gnosticism, who uh, basically accepted the Pelagian premise of presumption of free will. So you have two sides of the same false premise being attacked by a guy who wasn't intelligent enough to tie his own shoe back in the 4th century. Okay, He starts taking this word elect... And he notices, you know, he basically what he does is when he can't beat Pelagius with Scripture, he reverts back to his Manachian Gnosticism to pull ideas from there to refute Pelagius. And because Pelagius was always already recognized as a problem, everyone was on Augustine's side pretty much to, to put Pelagius away, but he brought with it a bunch of error as well. And that error is the Manachian view of the word election instead of the biblical view of the word election. And ever since the 4th century, so why does everybody think salvation when they think election without even questioning it? And I'm guilty. I'm guilty of doing that too. I did it for years and years and years. It's because way back in the 4th century, 1600 years before we came along at all, Augustine got people thinking in that mindset to where every time elect shows up, that's chosen to salvation without asking the Bible, chosen for what? Which is what you should ask. But he took the, he took the Manachian Gnostic concept of eclectos and imposed it onto the Bible's use of that word. And then from then on out, you know, Christendom has been ill-flavored with that mindset, and we don't even know it. It's just permeated everywhere. Everybody talks that way. We've been doing it for hundreds of years now, and we never should have done it. Put all that junk away and look and see what the Bible has to say about it, and you come up with a very different idea of how the Bible uses the word elect. So in our other video, we cover some of these other issues, like in Psalm 78, 80, he chose David, also his servant. Notice how choosing and servitude are connected. Those are what's interchangeable. He was chosen to serve as king, not chosen to be the only saved person. In Psalm 105, 26, he sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. There again, you, the same concept is used using servant and chosen interchangeably. That's how the Bible uses the phrasing. Isaiah 41, 8, but thou Israel art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen. Israel and Jacob are the same person art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen. It's a restatement of the same thing. Uh, there's, a, there's a Hebrew figure of speech called a hindiati where you restate the same thing in different words, usually separated by the word and or just with a comma to replace the and, okay? And that's what's happening here. It's a Hebrew figure of speech where the, you say the same thing twice using, using different words each time. Israel is different than Jacob, but it's the same. Servant is different than chosen, but it's the same. Israel... Thou, Israel, art my servant, and Jacob, whom I have chosen. So ser chosen and elect is always associated with being a servant, not with salvation. Isaiah 41.9, thou, who, thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and are called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, thou art my servant, I have chosen thee. Notice again, servant and chosen used interchangeably. Isaiah 43.10, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe. My servant whom I have chosen. There again, servant and chosen are connected. Isaiah 44, 1. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant and Israel, whom I have chosen, just like the previous passage we already looked about. Jacob is interchangeable with Israel. Servant is interchangeable with chosen. This is very clearly the flavor that the Bible gives to the word chosen and elect in Scripture. Very clear. You'd have to be a Gnostic to disbelieve this. Isaiah 44, 2, Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee in the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. And Jeshurun is an epithet for Israel, an epithet for Jacob, okay, whom I have chosen. So again, servant and chosen are used interchangeably. Haggai 2, 23, I will take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord. Servant and chosen, again. 
Chronicles 16, 13, O ye seed of Israel, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Servant and chosen, again, interchangeable. That's the flavor the Bible gives us. I've made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Chosen and servant are used interchangeably. This is undeniable. Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth, referring to Jesus Christ. There are two main elects in Scripture, Jesus Christ and Israel. Those are the two elects. Whenever you see the word elect, by default, it's usually one of those, and there are only a few cases when that's not the case, like in Colossians and a couple others that we're going to look at. But even in the New Testament, nobody is considered a servant or elect unless they are in Christ. So still, it is Christ who is the elect. And you are elect by virtue of being in Christ. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, out of Judah, the inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. There it is, a Hindiati again, saying the same thing twice, using different words, and elect and servants are the interchangeable words there. Matthew 24, 22, except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. Now later on in, in Revelation, as we're going to see when we look at Matthew... Th when we look at Mark 13, 20, we see that those the Israel is being is the elect here in Matthew 24, 22, and the 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel in Revelation are called the servants of God. So it's interchangeable across spans of passages as well. Matthew 24, 24, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And that elect again is the 144,000. You know, the apocalyptic passages are not about the church. Matthew, he is very obviously the ministry in the book of Matthew is to the Jews. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. Look at Matthew chapter 15, verse 24. I'm not sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He has not expanded the ministry to Gentiles yet. And he's speaking here in Matthew 24, still to the Jews, a very Jewish passage. Transition from the Jews to Gentiles um, after Acts 7, and then after the harpazo of the church, it's going to transition from the church back to Israel. That's why you have all these passages saying there's no difference between the Jew or the Greek, they're all one in Christ, that kind of thing. Then all of a sudden you get to the Hebrews, and then James, written to the 12 tribes. Hebrews is written to Hebrews, and then in the book of Revelation you've got 144,000 Jews of the 12 tribes. Well, if there's no difference between the Jews and the Greeks, and they're all one in Christ, why are we singling them out again? Because we're transitioning back when we get to the end times. So these apocalyptic passages that are spoken to Jews are going to be applicable once again when Jews are actively the elect. Again, specifically the 144,000 of the 12 tribes in Israel are being called the elect. They are the servants. They are called the servants in Revelation chapter 7. Titus chapter 1 verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and acknowledging of the truth. Now, Calvinists like to use this verse and say that there's a bunch of elect people walking around who don't have faith and they're waiting to get enlightened. They're waiting to be illuminated and get enlightened and have their moment of Hindu enlightenment. But the Bible says faith of God's elect. Calvinism believes in a faithless God's elect that has to later get faith. There is no such thing. Nobody is elect until they have faith. There's actually a book by John Parkinson, and we're going to refer to later, called The Faith of God's Elect. And it is a from a non-Calvinist, non-Arminian perspective, a book that I highly recommend. And I'm going to recommend it again in a few minutes. We're actually going to quote a, a little bit from it. Now, I want to bring you to this idea of choice men, okay? In the Bible, in, in the Old Testament, you see this phrase, choice men, choice men. And it's worded a little bit differently in the New Testament, but I think it helps if we start thinking of people in the New Testament elect and chosen, if we think of them as choice men, the same way the word is used in the Old Testament, I think it can really clear some things up, okay? They're trying to find some soldiers in 2 Chronicles 25.5 to do a specific task, and he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them 300,000 choice men able to go forth to war. So there, the word choice is used as men that meet a certain criteria, able to go forth to war. Now, in the military, we have choice men that do certain things. There's choice men, like we need everybody who's qualified airborne to go on this airborne mission, all right? Those are the people that get chosen to do that. It's chosen to do a certain thing. We need them to meet a certain criteria so that they can do it. 
In 2 Samuel 10, 9, it's soldiers again. He chose of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. So who are the best ones to go against the Syrians? we got to go up. <laughs> you got to get choice men, the ones who, everyone who scores above a 300 on their PT test or something like that. It, from my commissioning source, when I went into the Army as a lieutenant, our commission, my commissioning source was Marion Military Institute. And in our commission, for our physical fitness exam, we had, you know, there's, there's three physical fitness events, push-ups, sit-ups, and a run, two-mile run. And you had to score a, if you max everything out, you get 300 points, okay? That's the idea. Our criteria to graduate was that we had to get at least a 270. Now, you have to at least make a 180 in the Army or you fail, all right? A 180 with at least, a, I don't know, a 60 in each event. I'm not sure what the criteria is, how low you can go in each one. But you had to meet a certain criteria. It's been a while. But at our school, you had to make at least a 270, and you had to have at least a 90 in each event. So you couldn't sham on two events and, and you know then be a stud or a rock star in one event and make up for it. You had to be even. So it was we had to meet a certain criteria so that the school could say we only provide certain choice men to become officers in the army and they that's the criteria that they set that school set we're not going to commission you unless you meet this criteria and that's kind of the same thing that's going on here we need men to fight in this battle in a certain way and we need choice men that meet a certain criteria to do this task and that's that's what we're looking at in first chronicles 19:10 again he chose out of all the choice of Israel and put them in array against Syrians people who met a certain criteria not just <laughs> Not just the rank and file soldiers, but you know some elites who who met certain criteria. Proverbs eighteen ten, and knowledge rather than choice gold. You know, there's different kinds of gold. Like there's ten karat gold, there's white gold, there's twenty four karat gold, and depending on what you're trying to do, you might need a different kind of gold. So you could say the choice gold is the twenty four karat gold. In Proverbs eight nineteen. Um, fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and revenue than choice silver. The tongue of the just is choice is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. So you have this concept of like the silver and the gold meeting a certain criteria, the choice men meeting a certain criteria. And then Acts 15, 7, you see that God made choice among us. Peter is saying that the Gentiles, mainly at Cornelius' house, by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. It's very important that the apostle to the circumcision, to the Jews, was the one who brought forth this idea that Gentiles could now were now granted repentance into life, as Acts eleven eighteen says. So he was he was the choice person to do that task, not to be saved, but to do that task to serve in a certain capacity, if you will. And in all these cases, the choice men they were to serve as a soldier in a certain capacity for a certain task. That's what that choice indicates there. And I think, now somebody sent me, after, after I'd been thinking about this for months and months, somebody sent me a link. I think somebody wrote a whole book or an essay or a white paper or, or something developing this idea. And maybe I can get that link again and send it back out. I didn't have a, t- a chance to look at the, a whole lot, but to notice that that's basically the idea that it's developing. And I think that idea is, is a very valid point. And then when you look in the New Testament and you start seeing elect and chosen Start, think of it this way, choice people, people that meet a certain criteria. Now, when you see certain, a Calvinist is going to hear that phrase, meet certain criteria, and they're going to think, oh, you think you can earn your salvation. You you see, you're still thinking elections about salvation. It's not about salvation. It's about service. Has absolutely nothing to do with salvation. Now, I want you to imagine a hypothetical conversation in the throne, throne, throne room of heaven. And you say, well, there's no, you know, kind of like something like Job 1 and 2. And this can be used, this can be instructive just to think about some things that go on behind the scenes or some thinking that might go on behind the scenes. And this, I'm just using this to try to convey what I'm thinking to you, okay? Imagine God saying, I'm going to have certain choice people serving me. Somebody else says, well, who's that going to be? And God says, well, people who meet a certain criteria. Somebody else says, oh, yeah, what's the criteria? God says, well, they're going to be biological descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the guy says, okay, what's their mission? To be the only saved people? No, their mission is to be a peculiar people. And now this whole idea of being peculiar people, somebody pointed this out. Some, I saw Calvinists the other day point out, you were chosen to be a peculiar people. You, you know what a peculiar people does? 
they behave differently. They serve something different than something everybody else serves. It has to do with service. Wake up, people. Think, think. Know their mission is to be a peculiar people unto me by their behavior, their service, and to be a blessing to all the families of the earth, which was the original blessing, which was the original commission to Abraham. And God says, but this criteria will be temporarily supplanted after the rejection of Jesus. Somebody else says, oh, well, who's going to be serving you then? God says, well, certain choice people. Well, who's that going to be? You know, people who meet a certain criteria. Oh, yeah, what's the criteria? Well, they're going to be the ones who believe on the name of the one that I send. Those are going to be my choice people. What's their mission? To be the only saved people? No. Their mission is to be a peculiar people unto me by their behavior and their service and to bring forth fruit so that the world may believe. And those are direct quotes out of the book of John, by the way. And you can imagine the same kind of thing going on for the tribulation. I'm going to have certain choice people serving me there. And in the millennium, there's going to be certain choice people doing things for God there. Choice people, you know, set aside for a specific task is what we should be thinking. And I just put this little hypothetical conversation that might take place in the throne room of heaven to get you thinking along those lines, try to explain where I'm coming from. Remember, some of these things are difficult to articulate, especially when you've been taught all your life to think something else, okay? So God working through certain choice people which meet certain criteria clarifies who God is not working through. We already know that only those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are the ones serving God today in 2019, and as of today, the rapture hasn't happened yet. Okay? Imagine a scenario where any random lost person who seems to be wise could be an elect person of God who simply hasn't reached illumination or enlightenment yet of their own elect, of their own elect condition. You know, from the Calvinist or Gnostic perspective, the world is full of such people. But from the biblical perspective, there are no such people. Nobody is serving God, nobody's chosen, until they are in Christ. That's very key. Now, I had a Calvinist tell me just the other day that all of the elect were in Christ from the, from the death and resurrection of Christ. Oh, really? Then why do they have to be regenerated? Why do they have to be born again? Why do they have to be converted? I mean, if that were the case, wouldn't all of the elect, if they're in Christ, be just like John the Baptist, having the Spirit from their, from their mother's womb? You know how we get into Christ? The Holy Spirit puts us there after we believe. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 27, 1 Corinthians 1, 21. The Holy Spirit puts us there after we believe. So if they're in Christ, that means the Holy Spirit put them there, which means they have the Holy Spirit and they're in Christ from the, from the time they're conceived and born. So why would they ever need to be converted? They wouldn't. Now, I don't know if the guy incredibly misspoke, I'm pretty sure a lot of other Calvinists would disagree with that perspective. But this guy is like a, I would say a prolific writer, but he's a prolific rambler. <laughs> Writes a bunch of stuff, has a bunch of articles, his own website and that kind of stuff. That's what he said. That's what he said. He thinks all the elect were in Christ. And so theoretically, anybody, some philosopher out there, could be an elect person who's in Christ and just doesn't know it yet, and they're giving you good, true, good Christian things because God's leading them, and they're just not aware of their own election yet. I mean, it's like Hinduism, and you better, you better listen to them too, because who knows where God's going to send you the understanding from, because it certainly isn't Scripture. <laughs> Something about Catholics, Charismatics, and Calvinists, they all begin with C, and none of them believe the Bible. They all get their uh, understanding from somewhere other than Scripture. Something, you know, Scripture means something other than what it says. That's what they all three believe. Now, in the book, Faith of God's Elect, chapter 2, the name, name of the chapter is called The Election of Theology. It's a book by John Parkinson, and I've recommended this book in the past before. Now, he takes election, and um, I don't mean to disparage John here because he, he's a, I consider him a friend, and, uh, but, but I think he's, his emphasis kind of gets half of the story here. I, I have more of an emphasis on the service aspect and he has more of an aspect, uh, an emphasis on the future blessings aspect of election. Now, both of those are true, but he, he does not emphasize 
the service aspect as much as I think should be done. But anyway, with that in mind, listen to what he says. I think it's very interesting. In the scriptures, we learn that God chose the nation of Israel in Abraham to be his earthly election for blessings, which were material, earthly, and temporal. When we come to the church in the New Testament, we learn that God has chosen us to be in Christ before the foundation of the world to be his heavenly election for blessings, which are spiritual, heavenly, and eternal. The election of the church and this dispensation applies exclusively to the saints and to the purposes and blessings which succeed salvation. Now, purposes and blessings. Now, that's a hint at the service aspect that I'm emphasizing. I don't think he emphasizes it much as I do, but but I, I don't think he disagrees with me, if you understand what I'm saying. So I don't think we disagree on this. I just think that it's we word things differently or have a different approach. The election of theology, on the other hand, now that's a key difference that he points out, the election of the Bible versus the election of theology. The election of theology, on the, on the other hand, is to do with sinners and their individual selection for salvation or perdition. We are told that elect sinners totally unable to believe the gospel will be drawn by irresistible grace, given the faith to believe, and must of necessity persevere in their faith to the end. The death of Christ was completely and exclusively for the elect. Those who are not among the elect cannot be saved and will perish according to God's eternal decree. So that's the election of theology, okay? Thus, election has become a mere selection process for deciding the eternal destiny of every individual. The gospel is no longer a message of salvation offered in good faith to all men everywhere, but, because, but has become more like a coded message for the elect who, on hearing it, must respond irresistibly. That kind of sounds like Gnosticism to me, okay? When we bring this theology to bear on John 3.16, it begins to look like a parody of the gospel. It would say, For God so loved the world of the elect that he gave his only begotten Son exclusively for the elect, that whosoever has been predestinated, drawn by irresistible grace, and given the faith to believe in him, should not perish like those who have been predestined to perdition, but have everlasting life, provided they have been given the gift of perseverance. Now the purpose of this chapter is to trace briefly the historical emergence of this unscriptural view of election and predestination. Now this guy... He writes this chapter, and that's the introduction to the chapter. Let me tell you, let me tell you something about John Parkinson's book. It's a little thin book, and I am so impressed with this author's ability to compact great concepts into few words. He's very profound. He got, he got a lot of profound simplicity in the way he words things. So if you can get a hold of this book, The Faith of God's Elect, I'm going to try to look up the, <laughs> the links and supply them for you. And he's in the UK, so I think there's different links for if you buy that over there versus buying it over here. And he points out this, in, in the beginning of this chapter, he points out this very key issue is that the election of the Bible and the election of Scripture are two very different things. And that is absolutely dead on the money. They are two very different things. Later on in the same chapter, he separates these three ideas. The election of Calvinism is God's unconditional choice of individual sinners for salvation by divine decree by which they are drawn irresistibly to faith in Christ. The election of Arminianism is God's choice of an individual sinners for salvation. Note that that's, notice that that's the same in Calvinism and Arminianism. If Calvinism is God's choice of individual sinners to salvation... If that's election and Calvinism, then it is shared by Arminianism and Calvinism. It is not shared by the Bible believer. And in that sense, Arminianism is Calvinism. Okay? Then they differ, conditional on the person's free choice to believe in Christ as foreknown by God. The election of Scripture, on the, earth hand, on the other hand, is God's choice of the church in Christ for heavenly blessings. And I would say for service and heavenly blessings, and I don't think he would disagree with that, but he does do a good job of separating these things out. Now, the biblical view of election is not Arminianism. It's not Calvinism. It's nothing of the sort. Arminianism is a type of Calvinism. They both think that election is about God's choice of individual sinners for salvation. They both believe that. That is portion of what they both believe is a Calvinistic belief. And Arminianism is Calvinistic because it carries over Calvinistic thoughts like that. Election is not about the choice of sinners to be saved. And if you believe that it is, and you call yourself an Arminian, that is a Calvinist belief that you have. That's where you got that. You didn't get it from the Bible. Now, in the summary of that chapter, he goes on to say, We noted that the misrepresentation of scriptural election began with Augustine of Hippo failing to see that election was related to the choice of saints for blessing. Now, he didn't just fail to see that. He actually 
And now, I know this is just a summary. He's not trying to be detailed here. He actually got it from Manichaeanism. He brought, a, he brought in ideas from Manichaean Gnosticism, which caused him to fail to see what the Bible was saying. He taught that God had unchangeably decreed from eternity who would be saved and who would be lost. Augustine misunderstood grace to, to be an irresistible gift given to some pre-selected individuals who, and who, while denied to others. He failed to grasp the universality of the reign of grace. It was also noted that Augustine was the champion of sacerdotalism and sacramentalism and helped mold the Roman Catholic Church into its present form. The inst- now, I know you think that's spelled wrong, but it's a UK spelling, okay? The Institutes of John Calvin... The Institutes of John Calvin, where it touched on predestination and election, was largely based on Augustinian misconceptions. Calvin's successor, Theodore Beza, shifted, further shifted the emphasis of Reformed theology from justification by grace to election by grace. Beza and his school developed and defended their theological system by applying the deductive logic of Aristotle as the method for interpreting scripture and formulating doctrine. A debate ensued within Calvinism. The Bayesian approach was challenged by Arminius on the grounds. Now notice that the debate ensued within Calvinism, okay? Arminianism was a Calvinist squabble. The Bayesian approach was Challenged by Arminius on the ground that both content and methodology, the Calvinists, by fair means or foul, inflicted a crushing defeat on the the Arminians at what should have been an exchange of views at the Synod of Dort. The outcome of this debacle was the doctrine of five-point Calvinism as defined in the canons of Dort. This particular theology has permeated much of the thinking of Christian writers up to the present time. Indeed, the influence of Reformed theology has been so pervasive that many good men are totally unaware that some of their assumptions and presumptions owe more to Augustine and Aristotle than to Scripture. And that is absolutely dead on the money. Now, remember, this is just a summary of the chapter. You say, well, why don't you develop that? I'm not, I, I'm not here to read the entire book to you, but I want to show you that the research has been done on this stuff and to show you where the, the concepts that get into our heads about the wrong thinking behind election has a lot of historical baggage that comes along with it that we need to shed so that we can see Scripture clearly. If you can get a hold of that book by John Parkinson, The Faith of God's Elect, I highly recommend that you do so. And it's, it's a really little thin book. You can read through the whole thing probably in less than a day. Okay? So there are two ways to deal with Calvinists with regard to the concept of election. You can either leave their assumption intact and that, or you can identify and challenge the assumption. Now, in my video on election censored what they've been hiding from you that I reviewed earlier in this video. Um, in that video, I left their assumption intact and decided intact and decided not to deal with that issue in that video. And now I'm dealing with that issue. So if you leave their assumption intact, they assume election is about salvation. Explaining that it's about service and blessing is not and not sal- explaining to them that it's about service and blessing and not salvation is such a thought paradigm shift for most people, even for non-Calvinists, that the Bible believer needs to carefully weigh when is the right time to introduce this perspective. Even if, the, even if that assumption isn't addressed, their perspective can still be shown to be wrong with clear and plain scripture. Often this approach, leaving the assumption intact, is often done by default out of ignorance because the person arguing on behalf of biblical Christianity also mistakenly has the assumption and doesn't know it, okay, which I've done in the past. Or the second way is you can identify and challenge their assumption. When they start talking about elect, they they assume election and salvation are interchangeable, and they think that you assume that too. So you tell them election is about service, not salvation, since this is such a paradigm shift in their thought. The Bible believer needs to have a few ducks in a row to back up this perspective prior to mentioning it. Do not Now don't let that freeze you into fear to not take action and not have this discussion with people. That's not what I'm trying to get you to do. But take a few notes from this video, keep those notes on your phone where you can get to them and charge right into this issue with people. This video is designed to help you do this in an informed posture. That's what it's for. You can actually you can download the PDF of this off the website and keep it and refer to it if you want to, even if you want to have this discussion. One of the most famous passages that Calvinists like to bring up is Ephesians 1.4, according as he hath chosen us in him, the most important phrase in there, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now that in him creates problems for Calvinists, which accounts for why they like to leave it out so much. They either leave it out or they 
add words like to be. He chosen us to be in him, like chose to put chose to later put us in Christ. I'm selecting him, 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 and him, and later on, um, after they're born, I'm going to put them in Christ. Like that, That's how some of them read that. So you got two different ways. So it's either omit the in him or add to be is typically two ways that this is very commonly handled. I'm not saying that's the only way it's handled, but very commonly it's handled that way. Problem is that we were not in him before the foundation of the world. You see, in Ephesians 2.12, he's talking to the Ephesians, referring back to before they were converted. And he says, at that time, before you were converted, like the day before you were converted, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So before you were saved, you were without Christ. You were not in Christ. You were without Christ. The Calvinist reading of this has to put you in Christ before you before the foundation of the world. In him is the condition of the choosing. They like to say unconditional election. No, it is very conditional. It is in him. If you have salvation determined outside of Christ, what you believe is something other than Christianity. It's not Christianity. If you're a Calvinist, Christ is an afterthought of election. Election is where your salvation is, not Christ. Okay? So for the Calvinist... If, if you have to acknowledge the in him, you basically have to say that the sinner was in him before the foundation of the world, then somehow fell out of Christ, Ephesians 2.12, and then Jesus is coming along, you know, Luke 19.10, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, how'd they get lost? If they were in him before the foundation of the world, how'd they get lost? Well, they must have fallen out. Well, if you get back in him during now, who's to say you won't fall back out again? How sovereign is a Jesus who can't keep you in him once you're there? If you were there before the foundation of the world, how'd you get out before you got saved? How'd that happen? Well, maybe you're understanding the passage wrong. Did you ever think about that? I think that's something you should consider. And for that verse, you can go back and watch our other video on that verse. In Romans 16, 7, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and fellow prisoner, who are of note among the apostles, who were also in Christ before me. So people, there was a time while Paul was alive, when, when Paul was not in Christ, and Junius and Andronicus were in Christ before Paul was, and then later Paul got in Christ, so they were saved before Acts 9, in other words because he was saved in Acts 9. Now, in the Calvinist view, you have to have everybody in Christ before the foundation of the world. Chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Well, he wasn't in Christ before the foundation of the world. He wasn't in Christ in 31 AD. He wasn't in Christ probably in 34 AD. He wasn't in Christ probably till a year or so after the resurrection. Give or take. Now, I have on the left-hand side here John the Baptist. I mean, that should look just like the historic photos. And I have on the right-hand side here Jeremiah. Jeremiah was, you know, I knew before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee and ordained thee to be a prophet of the men. You know, Calvinists like to take these idea of Jeremiah, and they think everybody's Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1.5 is to everybody. No, it's to Jeremiah. <laughs> John the Baptist had the Holy Spirit from the mother's womb. If the Calvinistic view, if you have people in him before the foundation of the world, in order for the Calvinistic view to be correct, then everybody would be like John the Baptist. You'd have the Holy Ghost from your mother's womb. You'd be like, everybody would be like Jeremiah. Nobody would have to get saved. There would be nothing to preach to anybody because all the elect would already be regenerated. They'd already be in Christ. There would be nobody who still needs to be saved or be regenerated or needs to be born again or any of that. They'd all have the Holy Ghost. They'd already all be in him from, from before the, they were even born. So the whole, when you start twisting scripture to make it match a Gnostic system, which is what Calvinism is, you wind up making such a mess of things that nothing makes sense anymore. So if you take that passage further, Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, we just looked at verse 12 on that slide. Go back to Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. In other words, the Jews are calling you guys uncircumcised. At that time, at that time, ye were without Christ. That's when you were Gentiles getting called names by the Jews. While you're alive and breathing. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope 
without, how could an elect person who's in Christ have no hope and be without God in the world? Well, if Calvinism was true, they couldn't be. So Calvinism must not be true. See how easy that is? But now, there's a, there's a contrast here. What you were before you were converted is different than after you're converted. In Calvinism, you were in Christ the whole time. But here, you get placed in Christ. It's different. Now, in Christ, contrast, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So there is a difference between then and now, and that then and now isn't before the foundation of the world. It's before you were converted into Christianity. So if you take the concept of Christ as this white portion here, he, I have this alpha and this omega on the left and the far right. Christ is eternal. He is the alpha and the omega. When a person receives Christ, he gets placed into Christ. And so he fills up all of what Christ is, and you share, you are a joint heir with Christ, and you share all of his attributes. So now you get placed into the eternal Alpha and the Omega. Now, since Christ was loved by God before the foundation of the world, and since Christ is the elect from before the foundation of the world, once you are in Christ, you are too. Now we take the next step. Now let's deal with that word chosen and realize it's not about salvation. So I always want to ask an observation question. Remember, remember our observation series. We had a whole set of videos on biblical interpretation, and you'll want to ask your observation questions, your hermeneutical observation questions. Ephesians 1, 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now you should ask the question, chosen for what? See, the Calvinist fills that in with, with a presumption without even knowing they're doing it. Chosen for salvation before the foundation. That's not what it says. Remember, in biblical interpretation, you question everything. So we're going to ask, chosen for what? And we see in the lower hand part of the verse there, Ephesians 1, 4, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. It has to do with your behavior. Be ye holy, for I am holy. You know, if any man be blameless and desires the office of a bishop, he needs to be blameless, husband one. Be holy and without blame before him in love. You are supposed to behave a certain way. You're supposed to serve a certain way. And starting in chapter 4, verse 1, the entire rest of the book is about your behavior, your walk. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you do what? Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So you are chosen to, do, to serve in a certain capacity. You have a vocational calling, something you are supposed to do as a Christian, and that is what you are chosen to do, to be holy and without blame in that mission. That's what you're supposed to do. And that's what that verse is about. That's what that book is about. And then if you keep going in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 through 7, servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh without with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ. Now, I know he's already talking to people who are servants, endangered servitude, all right? It's not exactly the slave or the chattel slavery that we think of today, all right? So, some Bibles say slaves, it's servants. It's a lot different here. Servants is a better word. But as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Now, that's the case with any Christian, though. Any Christian should be serving God with singleness of our heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So again, the concept of being chosen is chosen to do something, and that is to serve. Service and election are always connected in Scripture. Now notice over in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, he's talking to the Colossians. He says, put on therefore as the elect of God. Now that's a simile. As if you are like Christ. Christ is the elect of God. As the elect of God. Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Those are behaviors. The way you serve. Those are attributes of behavior and service. Now look when Paul does a comparison in the very next chapter, also verse 12, the concept of elect of God is restated as servant of Christ later in the same letter. Epaphras, who is one of you, one of the elect of God. So instead of saying as the elect of God here, he says a servant of Christ. 
saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So he identified their group as the elect of God. And when he refers to the group again as one of you, also a servant of Christ, he uses that phrase in place of the elect of God, what he called them just one chapter earlier in chapter 3, verse 12. So one, so you keep seeing throughout Scripture this elect, this concept of elect and servant are connected. It's not elect and salvation, it's elect and servant. The elect, as the elect of God, in other words, the elect are supposed to have a certain look, put on. It's like you're on this team, if you're, you know, I'm, I'm in New Orleans, if you're one of the New Orleans Saints, that's, that's appropriate for this discussion, isn't it? if you're one of the New Orleans Saints, put on the uniform as a New Orleans Saint, and do what a New Orleans saint is supposed to do, okay? So if you are a Christian, if you are, in other words, the elect of God look a certain way and they do certain things, all right? They're not chosen to be saved, they're chosen to serve, they're chosen to do those things. In Romans chapter 9, verse 4, there's something that's very peculiar here that I think a lot of Calvinists don't realize when they're going through Romans chapter 9. By the way, Romans chapter 9, we did a video on that recently. It it in my opinion, is one of the most damning chapters to Calvinism. It, it is a huge refutation of Calvinism. Maybe the strongest chapter in the Bible against Calvinism. <laughs> if you read it in its context, it says everything it says is opposite of Calvinism. Okay, so he's talking about Israelites, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Why doesn't he say to whom pertaineth the election? Now, Calvinists like to say, you ask about election, they like to go to Romans chapter 9 and talk about election. Well, election is not used in Romans chapter 9 except for in one place, and that's in Romans chapter 9, verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Notice that in Romans chapter 9, nobody is elected to be saved. Nobody. Certainly nobody in after Acts 2 is elected. The, the word election is not used in, in reference to anybody after Acts 2 in Romans chapter 9. That is, after the resurrection of Christ and after the Holy Spirit is given. That's, where, that's why Acts 2 is important. Those certain phase lines. So, one of these guys is chosen, chosen, if you look back in Genesis 2, while they're not yet born, not before the foundation of the world, but so that the purpose of God, according to election, in other words, Jacob has to serve a certain purpose. Whether or not he's saved, whether or not his descendants are saved, is beside the point he is to serve a certain purpose, and he is elect to do that. He is called. He is called to do something. Not called to be saved, but called to do something. To represent God on earth and be a blessing to all the other nations on behalf of God. Romans eleven twenty eight. 28, look how it refers to Israel. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Here you have enemies of the gospel who in Rome, it's by the way, in, in Romans 9, it's Israel who's being hardened and blinded. No Gentiles are being hardened and blinded. Go back and watch that video when you get a chance. Enemies of the gospel are referred to as the election. Why? Because they still fill a role. They still serve a purpose. They're still doing something, playing a role that God has them doing. They're still the election. Notice that. So you might ask that question back in Romans chapter 9, verse 4. And the service of God, why doesn't it say the election of God? It does say the election in Romans eleven twenty-eight. 28. The whole concept there is used interchangeably. Service and election are used interchangeably. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, there's this passage that says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. And because that word election is there, the Calvinists jump all over that. And there's so many problems with that. Now, the very first video I ever did on Calvinism was on this verse. And it wasn't because I, I was, just happened to be going through 1 Thessalonians in a Sunday school class that I was teaching, and that word election was there. So I figured I didn't want to take the class time up to talk about Calvinism because of their, one of their buzzwords was there. So I'll just do a video on the side. Now in that video, I treat election as if it's to salvation. And I admit that it's completely out of ignorance. 
And you can still go back and watch the video. I left it online. You can still go back and watch that. It's one of those things that I watch whenever I'm feeling sick and I need to make myself throw up. Okay, so <laughs> there's a video on Ephesians 1 4 where I treat the word election. But even if you do think election means salvation there, your election of God, does that mean God chose them or does that mean they chose God? Okay. <laughs> Even if you think, but it's not about that. So understand the election is about service. Now let's look at verse three. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience and hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election of God. What is their election of God? So you're going to, now that we know what we know about election, that it's connected with service, you're going to ask the observation question. In what capacity were they elected to serve? And this here is a corporate election, not a corporate election like in Christ, corporate election like some people teach and think of whatever. It's not, that's not what I'm getting to at all, all right? And I'm not necessarily disparaging that. I'm just saying that's not, that's not what I mean by corporate election here. And you'll see what I mean in a second. But it has to do with that, that the church at that location has to fill a certain role. And that role is your work of faith and labor of love. Paul sees their work of faith and labor of love and is like, whoa, that's what God chose them to do. They need, they, God chose the church at this location to do that. Well, what is it? He goes on to tell you. So you're going to ask that question, elected to do what? What is this work of faith and labor of love that makes their election, their, the purpose that they were chosen to serve, so clear to Paul? It's so that you were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Now, we're going to look at the map in a second. But if you look right there, Thessalonica is a city. And sometimes when you see these places mentioned in the Bible, it, it, they, don't, they don't explain to you that one place is a city and one place is a state. Or not a state, but like a region, okay? Like the difference, somebody who's not from the United States might not understand the difference between New Orleans and Louisiana, okay? So if I say the word sounded out from you from New Orleans to all of Louisiana, and you know that Louisiana is a pretty large state comparatively to some others, you're like, oh, that's pretty impressive. That's, that's something else there, because New Orleans is a very small place compared to the rest of Louisiana. And like Thessalonica is one little city, Macedonia is a region. Achaia is a region. So from that one little city spread out the word of God. From you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. So Paul and his crew, they want to go around and evangelize all these people, but the Thessalonians already got to them. They already got around to all the people in Macedonia and Achaia, and there's a bunch of converts walking around who are already Christians in all these places. So we don't even need to convert these people. We don't need to say anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God to serve, serve the living and true God, in what capacity? Sounding out the word to Macedonia and Achaia. And to wait for his son from heaven is something else to do, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So when Paul says, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, he's saying, I know that God chose this church at this location to sound out the word in Macedonia and Achaia. I understand God's strategic purpose for this now. So way back in Acts chapter 15, when he, you know, he has a dream and he heard, he heard the Macedonian call, somebody from Macedonia says, you know, we, come and help us. Paul goes over there, gives the Thessalonians what they need. And that was a strategic move by God. Because you look at the map. You look at where Thessalonica is. Thessalonica is a port city. And what happens in the port city, if you want to come from Asia Minor over there, Ephesus or any of those towns over there, and you want to go into Macedonia, you're going to sail to Thessalonica to go there. Well, guess what is in Thessalonica? A church. <laughs> there is a church in Thessalonica and all the people that are coming through, you know, they didn't travel as fast back then as they do now. They're not, they're not jumping off a ferry and hopping in a car and driving off. They got to find somewhere to stay. They traveled for a long time. They're going to sleep. They're going to talk with people. The church is getting these people. They're converting these people. And as, they, and as they go on with their journey on land to the rest of Macedonia and then some down to Achaia and otherwise... They are going now as Christians because the church at Thessalonica got to them. 
So God strategically elected the church in Thessalonica to sound out the word in Macedonia and Achaia for several reasons. And their location, the fact that they're a port city, is one of those reasons. So Paul, what Paul is saying, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, is like, now, now I see why God wanted a church in this city. Look what a church in this city can do. That's, that's the capacity in which they were elected to serve. Notice how much more sense the passage makes now. Read it that way. And it makes so much more sense when you read it the Bible way versus thinking of, instead of thinking election as salvation, God chose them to be saved. No, God chose them to do that task. He strategically chose that, the church in that location. That's why I said corporately earlier, because it's not necessarily the individuals there, but he needed a church there to do that work, and they did it. Mark 13, 20, I pulled this kind of random out of a hat. There's a bunch of passages in the apocalyptic literature in the Gospels that talk about the elect, and all of those references are to Israel. But for so, except the Lord, Mark 13 20, except the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Now, Calvinists, they're very me centered. They're like my cat. When I walk up my stairs, I have a cat at the top. My cat, my cat is up at the top of the stairs looking at me. And all I'm doing, I'm just going to walk up to the stairs and I'm going to walk to my room or I'm going to walk to my office. But not, that's not what the cat thinks. The cat acts like I am conducting a predatory attack on the cat. And he prounces down and he crouches and he acts like I'm some kind of enemy. And he waits till the last second and he dashes like mad to hide in one of the closets. That's if I come up the stairs fast without talking to him first. He thinks, he thinks it's all about him, you see. It has nothing to do with him. Sometimes a cat's sitting on my bed... And, and I'll pull, I'll pick up a pair of pants or something off the bed and the cat thinks that pair of pants is about to attack him. It, nothing to, I'm not thinking of the cat, poor thing. I'm just trying to pick up a pair of pants and put them on. But he thinks that has something to do with him. So he's all crouching and then he jumps and attacks the pants. And Calvinists are like that. The, you know, the cat is, is very hypothalamically driven. If you were to remove almost all the brain of a cat and just leave the hypothalamus in place, a cat would generally act just like a cat would usually act. Uh, but they're, <laughs> they're, they're just be hyper curious all the time though. But they, all, all those instinctive things, and it's a very narcissistic view where they interpret everything in their surroundings as if it has something to do with them. And that's how a Calvinist is. A Calvinist is a very, has a very narcissistic view of scripture. And because of the baggage that comes along with the word elect, when they see for the elect's sake, they're like, like, like my cat. Oh, that's me. That's me. It's after me. For the elect's sake, that's me. Whom he hath chosen, that's me. That's me. That has absolutely nothing to do with you. That has to do with Jews in the tribulation period. This is an, apost this is an apocalyptic passage dealing with an apocalyptic time, which is called the time of Jacob's trouble. And the church won't be there, which means maybe you will be, but hopefully not if you're saved. Okay. So except for the elect's sake whom he hath chosen, Calvinism is the most me-centered and man-centered theology within all of Christianity. Everything's me, 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 me. Everything's about me. All the chosen, all the elect, all that stuff's about me. Stuff that's just directly to the apostles is me, 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 me. Just like, just like the cat when I'm coming up the stairs, okay? In Revelation chapter 7, verse 3 through 4, God says to the angels who've been charged to hurt the earth, he says, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed in 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And then it goes on and names the 12,000 from each of the different tribes. And so when he says, except for the elect's sake whom he hath chosen, the elect's sake are the servants in Revelation chapter 7. It has nothing to do with any Calvinist in, in 2019. I'm filming this. On May 26, 2019, and the elect sake whom he hath chosen in Mark 13, 20 has absolutely nothing to do with you, Calvinist. Unless you happen to be a Jew who's not saved and will be alive in the tribulation period, you might be one of those, I don't know. But generally it has nothing to do with you. 
And then Revelation 17, 14, when the enemies of, of God make war with the Lamb, the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. They're doing something. They serve a purpose, chosen and faithful. So during that time period, the elect during then, by the way, the, that called and chosen, get a Calvinist to talk about what called means in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 30. And then take that called over into the book of Matthew where it says, and many shall be called and few shall be chosen and see what they do with that there. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> they get kind of duplicitous on you. They start playing word games. So that's kind of fun if you want to track that down. Peter chapter 1 verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. Peter, an apostle, and a lot of you ask me about this, so we're going to, we're going to handle this quickly here. Try to handle it quickly. So there's this phrase, elect according to foreknowledge. Let's look at what it says. Peter, an apostle, Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So he's writing from Babylon which is really Babylon, it's not Rome, and he's writing to all these people scattered over to Pontius Galatia. And the strangers, Peter is the apostle to the circumcision, which is to the Jews. And so he's writing to these Jews who spread out after the dispersion, after the persecution of Stephen, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. He's writing to all these Jews that are all spread out. And he refers to them as elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, just about everyone who reads that verse, they'll, they'll read that as chosen to be saved according to the foreknowledge of God. And the Arminian takes the Calvinist view of chosen to be saved, and they say according to God's foreknowledge that they would believe. All right? And then the Calvinist, that even if you let elect be the Calvinist meaning there, it still refutes Calvinism anyway. Okay? But then, but then Arminians unnecessarily bring a Calvinistic meaning with them in that verse. So now that we know elect doesn't, doesn't mean chosen for salvation, but chosen to serve in a certain capacity. Now read it again. Instead of elect according to foreknowledge, think about how God uses service, servant. So chosen to serve according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ, grace be unto you and peace be multiplied. So it is not saved according to God knowing in advance that you would believe, which is how the Arminian reads it. That's Arminianism reading Calvinistic presuppositions into the word elect. It is chosen to serve in a capacity in accordance with what God foreknew would be required to be accomplished by you at this time and place. So the sprinkling of the blood of the people... It says, unto the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and you might get the idea in your head that that is, um, you were elect before the foundation of the world unto the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, which was sprinkled on you at the cross because you're one of the, that kind of thing. But that's not what Peter's getting at here. What Peter is, the people he's talking to are familiar with the Old Testament, and they're going to know the context of where this appears in Exodus chapter 24, verse 7 through 8, when blood is sprinkled on the people. It's a covenant God makes with his people after he gives them instruction and they reply with the phrase, all that the Lord hath said, we will do and be obedient. Then they get the blood sprinkled on them. See how that works? In other words, you are now part of a covenant where you are expected to do something and be obedient. That is, be a servant. Look at Exodus chapter 24, verse 7 through 8. And he took the blood of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord hath said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. What Peter is getting at here is that once you have said, you acknowledge the Messiah, and once you get saved and converted, you're basically saying, All that the Lord hath said, we will do and be obedient. I'm not advocating lordship salvation, but if you're saved, he is your Lord and you will at least try, okay? Your salvation doesn't depend on your works. Don't get that idea. But he is your Lord and you should be obedient to him. And when you get saved, you are acknowledging that he is your Lord and that you should obey. And 
and the blood being sprinkled on the people occurs after that confession of the people. That's very clear. And it brings with it a responsibility to do something. So they have to do something. And then the rest of the book of 1 Peter, if you look at what it says, and then you can read the rest of the book of 1 Peter to see what they're chosen to do, to be a peculiar people, chosen generation, a peculiar people. And then there's things specifically outlined that they are supposed to do. They're going to do it. That's important. So elect according to the foreknowledge is not chosen to be saved according to God's foreknowledge that you would believe. It's chosen to serve in accordance with the capacity according to God's foreknowledge of what he knows needed to be done by you at this time. That's what it's getting at. And so he's telling them they are part of a blood covenant now, just like the one in Exodus 24, where now they are expected to do something. And he's using that analogy instead of having this blood sprinkled on you in the Old Testament from a lamb or a goat, You are committing to this covenant, and now it's the blood of Christ we're talking about here. So it's a serious serious business, and they are now part of this covenant, and they need to take it seriously. That's that's essentially what Peter's saying here. There's another passage in 2 Peter 1, verse 10, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fail. And that, that confuses a lot of people, to make your calling and election sure. Now, we know what a calling is. You're called to do a certain thing. You're voca- there's two callings in Scripture. There's a calling of the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, and there's the vocational calling, like in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Walk worthy of the, vo- of the calling, where w- of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So your calling is what you're called to do, your vocational calling, and your election is the capacity in which you were chosen to serve. Now, if you read it that way, Give diligence to make your vocational calling and capacity in which you were chosen to serve sure. That is proven. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. See how much more sense that makes when you read it the way the Bible has it? When you understand election the way the Bible uses it as opposed to the way theology uses it? So what's it, how do you make your calling and election sure? So notice if you're a Calvinist, how could you make your election sure? If election is chosen to be saved, how could you make that sure? You couldn't. So a verse like this would mean absolutely nothing in a Calvinist or an Arminian mindset. The only way it means something is if we let the Bible tell us how it uses the word election. Chosen to serve in a certain capacity to do something for God. What is that? Chapter 1, verse 5, and beside all this, give diligence, and he tells them you need certain things. You need faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So you want to be fruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You want to do something. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fail. And when you understand calling and election the Bible way instead of the Calvinist way, it makes so much more sense. So much more sense that way. So if you were to restate and expound this in a way to avoid Calvinistic word hijacking and baggage, and some people say, oh, you're rewording the Bible. No, I'm not doing that at all. Every time you have a a commentary or a sermon, you're expounding the passage to give the sense of it and help people understand it, just like in Nehemiah chapter 8. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make the purpose of your vocation and the role of service for which you were chosen visibly proven and demonstrated by your behavior. Prove it. If you were selected to do a certain task, demonstrate it behaviorally. That's how you make it sure. That's how you prove it. Make sure it gets done. This is about making sure something... This is something that is within the purview of the individual to do. If election is understood Calvinistically, that is not within the purview of the individual to do. It has absolutely nothing to do. It's unconditional, remember? So that verse would make absolutely no sense whatsoever under the Calvinist mindset. But under the Bible-believing mindset, it makes perfect sense. Now I want to take another issue where the word shows up, where Calvinists are are very me-centered, like my cat. They think everything's about them. Okay, very narcissistic reading of Scripture. We see that the apostles are chosen. Now, some people talk about the apostles, and they have this idea that they're not apostles until Christ rises again, but that's simply not how Scripture uses the word. In Luke 6, 13, when it was that day, he called unto him his disciples, 
and of them he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. Now there's that word chose. Does that mean that those twelve are the only ones that are saved? No, a lot of other people get saved besides those twelve. So that's not an exclusive term. Is there cho- what is an apostle? It's an office of service, to serve Christ in a certain capacity. He chose twelve to serve. And every time you see the word chose or elect, it's, it's chosen to do something. To be an apostle is their vocational calling. That is their election. Their calling and elect, make your calling and election sure would be to be a good apostle. That's what that would be. It had nothing to do with their salvation. Even so, one of the 11 goes to perdition. <laughs> it's not saved anyway. Okay? But the point here is that, so apostles is used before Christ dies and raises again, rises again. And they're chosen specifically. He talks about them being chosen, which is important for a lot of other reasons as well. Like when you get to this whole thing that Calvinists do with John 6 and given that these, these 12 are the given of John 6, 37 and of John chapter 17 verses 9 through 12. They're the ones that he was with while he was on earth and they have a certain job to do. In Mark 16.30, in Mark 6.30, and the apostles gathered themselves together. So they're called apostles while Christ is still alive. Now the names of the 12 apostles, Matthew 10.2, now the names of the 12 apostles are these, and he goes on to name them. So the word apostle is used, they're chosen to be apostles, very clear about that. In John 6.70, Jesus says, answered them and says, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? Now knowing what you know from Luke 6.13, chosen for what? Now, if you take that out of context and and read Calvinism into the word chosen, you would think that would mean chosen to be saved because they see that every time that word chosen or elect shows up. But they're not chosen to be saved. They're chosen to be apostles. And one of those apostles who's serving in that capacity happens to be a devil, Judas Iscariot. Judas, man of Kirioth. John 15, 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Now there goes the Calvinist again acting like my cat. He sees himself there. I have chosen you. It's me. God chose me. God chose me. Jesus is not talking to you there. Who did he choose in Luke 16, 13? Luke 6, 13. He chose 12 whom he named apostles. Who's he talking to? Those same 12. Or 11 by that point. Ye have not chosen me. But I have chosen you, apostles. How many times have you seen John 15, 16 used, even by non-Calvinists, to refer to modern day believers? You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. It happens all the time. All the time. I remember it happened to me when I was in the third grade. I remember that verse being used as if I had been chosen because that verse was about God choosing me. It's not about you. You brainless cat, it's not about you. You know, cats are very hypothalamically driven. All, all the urges in your hypothalamus, they, they make you want to eat and drink, and they make you curious, and they make you want to mate. All the basic bodily functions that you need to do to be alive is what your hypothalamus does. And, and cats are very hypothalamically driven. They're, they're very reactive to everything. And that's, that's exactly how a Calvinist is. They're very hypothalamically driven. Oh, it's me, it's me. It's me. This is about me. It has nothing to do with you. You know, Jesus just walking up the stairs going to his room and you're jumping around like he's out to get you. It's not about you. Okay? Grow up. Stop looking at everything so narcissistically. You've not chosen me, but I have chosen you, 12 apostles, and ordained you that you should do something. I have chosen you to be saved. It's not what he says. Chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Now, if the Christian from May 26, 2019 fits into this verse, it is not in the 12 that are chosen, or the 11 here. It is in the fruit that they bring forth. If you want to read us into that verse, that's the only place we could fit. We are not those chosen. We could be chosen in another sense, in another passage, but not this passage. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the 12 apostles that he's talking to in the context that he's talking to them. That he chose them to be apostles, then choose them to be saved. That's the capacity in which they serve. Are we getting it? 
I hope we're getting it. Now notice that every time you see the word elect or election or chosen, here are some of the hermeneutical guidelines you need to follow. This is very important. So I can't take the time in this one video to cover every passage where the word elect shows up, even though we did that almost in the previous video. But I can give you some hermeneutical guidelines. So these are very important. You might want to screenshot this and put it somewhere or retype it out in the notes on your phone, something like that. Number one, remember the concept of choice men in the Old Testament, that is people who meet certain criteria who are the best suited for a known task. In the New Testament, that suiting would have to be regeneration before somebody can be considered suitable to be of service. In other words, those that believe on Jesus Christ are the choice people serving God. Number two, remember the connection of election with service starting in the Old Testament and continuing throughout the Bible. Service, being a servant, and being elect, those things are connected. Always remember that every time you see the word. Number three, remember to ask the basic observation interpretation questions, such as A, who or what is being chosen or elected? B, who or what is doing the choosing or electing? C, for what purpose is the entity being chosen or elected? Hint, it's never salvation. And I say entity because sometimes it's a group or a church at a place. Sometimes it's not always an individual. D, ask in what capacity is this entity being chosen to serve? E, ask what function or role the election is for. For example, Israel is still considered the election in Romans eleven twenty eight, even though they are being hardened and blinded in Romans chapter 9 as a whole. But the nation of Israel still plays a vital role in how God relates to the rest of the planet, especially as the end times approach. Second example I have is Paul. He is a chosen vessel to God, not to be saved, but to bear God's name before the Gentiles and kings and the kings of it and the children of Israel, Acts 9.15. So Paul is an ideal candidate to be chosen to do that task because he's both a Jew and a Roman citizen, which gives him more freedom of mobility and passage throughout the empire. He's also studied the most renowned Jewish teacher of the day, Gamaliel, giving him credibility among the Jews. So his election to serve in that capacity was for a specific purpose, not salvation, and it was extremely conditional. He met certain criteria for which God needed a person to do that. Now remember, when you confront a Calvinist with any of this, they are not going to accept it. They're not going to play well. They're they're going to attack you in all sorts of ways. You are the devil, okay? I have a video called Calvinist Tactics Exposed. You need to watch that video because when, when you start talking about election from the biblical standpoint to a Calvinist, be prepared for all hell to break loose because it's going to. And that video is designed to tell you the different avenues of approach that their attack is going to take. And there might be some that I didn't cover on there, but that'll give you some of the idea. It's not going to go well. It's not going to be pretty. And there's going to be lots of ad hominem attacks, and you're suddenly going to be a heretic and a blasphemer, okay? Because they don't, they don't know any other way to deal with things that are outside what they're already thinking, okay? Remember, it's very narcissistic. So remember all the Calvinist tactics that will be employed against you for trying to shed light on one of their primary stumbling blocks. Remember, to a Calvinist, you are a heretic if you challenge their accepted ways of thinking. They have no interest or curiosity about the content or meaning of Scripture. They arrogantly presume that it's all figured out, and any deviation from what they think is so will be treated as heresy and blasphemy as an attack on the attributes of God. You will be personally attacked and mischaracterized. That's what's going to happen. Mark her down. If God is sovereign, and He is, then his sovereignty is first demonstrated in the fact that he is not an illiterate imbecile who can't communicate clearly, as Calvinists would have you believe. When Calvinists say understanding comes from God, I just had one tell me that the other day, what they mean by that is by some means other than the Bible, okay? In other words, if you are truly enlightened with the proper understanding, then you too, Gnosticism, you know, then you too, will realize from God's understanding that Scripture actually means something other than what it says. Because they have the enlightenment in God to understand something that Scripture means something other than what it says. And if you're enlightened, you'll get that too. 1 John 2, 2 doesn't mean propitiation of the sins of the whole world. It means something else. Well, you got to get that understanding from God. That's Gnosticism. So this is the heart of what they are getting at when they say understanding comes from God. It's a dog whistle way of saying that this does not come from the plain reading of Scripture. 
The Calvinist God either authored an esoteric book where all the truth is hidden behind opposite language, or he is a blithering, illiterate imbecile who can't put two sentences together coherently, especially if they contain words like all, every, or world. Notice how the first option sounds a lot like Gnosticism, and the second option sounds a lot like God can't communicate effectively without help from a Calvinist to straighten him out. Talk about exalting man and diminishing God. They take the cake. Understanding does come from God, and the Bible is the form in which that understanding is delivered. There is no system to which Scripture needs to be subjected in order to get its real esoteric Gnostic meaning. All we need to do is simply let the Bible speak for itself. Every time a Calvinist refers to upholding an attribute of God, like sovereignty or omniscience or omnipresence or being omnipotent or glory, giving God the glory, any of those things, the flip side of that shadow game is that they are using these issues as vehicles to cover up the fact that their position violates scriptural authority. And that... Scriptural authority, that is the thermal exhaust port of the Calvinist Death Star into which all ammo must be fired. Scriptural authority. That is always the issue, and it is the only issue. Scriptural authority. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Help share and get this video out in front of other people. This video is probably going to rattle some cages. I think it's radically different from the way most people think, even if they're not Calvinistic. If you have any questions, you can email me at kevin at beyondthefundamentals.com. Follow us on Facebook. You can go to the website, beyondthefundamentals.com, where more material is available. This will be available in PDF form on the website. And remember the other materials that are available on Etsy if you want those products from the previous video. And also on the website, if you so choose, this ministry can be supported monetarily as well. So thank you so much for watching. May the Lord bless you.